So here's the scenario. You're dispatched to a residential neighborhood for a 64 year old male in cardiac arrest. While en route, dispatch also advises you that the patient has a ventricular assist device. Once you arrive on scene, you find that patient unresponsive to all stimuli lying in the living room floor. As you begin that assessment, their airway is patent. They are breathing just very shallow and they are pulseless with cool, dry skin. So you're asked, what, which of these two falling things are most appropriate to do next? Initiate chest compressions, assist ventilations, oscillate over the point of maximum impulse, the PMI, or power cycle that VAD. So let's dive into this. First, let's understand what that VAD actually is. It is a ventricular assist device, or it may also be referred to as a left ventricular assist device. Basically because in these patients, their left ventricle has failed. It is not able to meet the ejection fraction that the body needs for homeostasis. So the VAD comes in and within that VAD is an impeller. It just continually spins and circulates blood. So rather than that ventricle squeezing to push blood up through the aorta, it goes into this pump, it circulates, and just keeps flowing blood through the body. It is all mechanically driven, operates off batteries, and operated by this controller. So the components of that, we have the pump itself. As I said before, that is, um, there's just a impeller in there that continually circulates. Now in the newer models, every once in a while, it'll spin a little bit faster just to try to prevent any type of excessive coagulation. So that's the biggest fear with VAD patients is clotting. That is all powered through this drive line. So this drive line will go through a surgical implantation site within the abdomen and is generally made out of like a Kevlar hose. So it goes from the controller box, which it has this little LED screen on it that shows all the settings, the variables, a light up display, any type of warning lights are all on that controller unit that's exterior. So the, ex the controller has this drive line that goes through through that surgical site, through the abdominal cavity, and up. And all that is powered by two batteries. So those batteries are worn by a vest or carried in like a shoulder bag. There's a bunch of dis different accessories that they can use to carry those bags, but it is always ran by batteries. Just as like, you know, your monitors. Monitors had two batteries, so in case one dies, the backup one is there. You can swap out a battery at a time, still keep things running. The VAD will operate that same way. So with these VADs, big thing to note, there will not be a pulse. That left ventricle that's generally creating that pulse by its squeeze, it's not working. The blood is being flowed by that pump. So it is not being squeezed to create that pulsation. It is just a continual flow of blood through the vascular system. So we don't have a pulse. If we don't have a pulse, we can't get a blood pressure. The only way to really evaluate that is by Doppler. Okay, by using Doppler, it can measure that pressure um, and being able to hear it of that slight pulsation being created by that impeller speeding up ever so intermittently. Some things that are reliable is capmography, that in tidal CO2 will still be able to tell us the overall perfusion status going on within our body. Still relying on our ABCs, airway breathing circulation. Now while we can't sense that pulse, skin tone, temperature, condition are all things that are still reliable for patient indicators. Um, when it comes to rate control, this is doing its own thing. Regardless of the electroactivity going on in the heart of what that conduction is trying to do, it is 100% reliant on that controller and what it is calibrated at by that bad center of what it's going to do. So big thing, treating symptoms that we see within these patients. So once we've done that, we've done our airway, our breathing, our circulation with VADs, we do ABCs one more time. So we are going to oscillate. We'll take our stethoscope, listen over that point of maximum impulse. So right in that same place, we would put V4 
of our 12 lead is right where we're going to oscillate that point of maximum impulse where you can most gently hear the heart the loudest. That is right where that pump is going to be. And when you listen for it, you're listening for a humming effect. So just hmm, hmm, hmm. That is the electronic sound by that pump being controlled. So we're going to oscillate A. Then we're gonna check batteries and power, making sure that our screen here is lit up, check for any type of warning lights. Remember, green is good, yellow is a warning, red is danger. So if you see that collar on any of those, those are your warning indicators. So we're checking to make sure we have power there, it is illuminated, then we can be checking batteries, just like most other batteries, they have the press indicator to show the bars of how much battery life is left. Um, if the batteries are dead, they can legitimately be plugged into the wall outlets. Okay, and then consult. So we'll ABCs, also take, check batteries and power, and then we're going to consult. We will consult, recall that bad center to try to troubleshoot through this. Now, when it comes time for indications to actually begin chest compressions, because we're acclimated to wanting to begin chest compressions on patients without a pulse. But those other few steps must come first before we initiate those compressions. So after ABCs times two, all that has failed, nothing is working, we verify the VAD isn't working, you know, consultation isn't helping any, then we begin CPR. Or if end title is less than 20. If you measure end title on them, less than 20, even if that bat is still working, it is failing. So begin compressions on them because an end title of 20, critical hypoperfusion. So priority. So in this scenario, the things we want to do for that patient who is unresponsive, pulseless, because bad patients are pulseless, and is assistive ventilations, and we're going to oscillate that point of maximum impulse. So we want to start that troubleshooting. So we did our first ABCs. Their airway is patent. They are breathing. Skin was cool, dry, just no pulses. Then we do ABCs again, beginning with A, oscillate that PMI area to be listening to see if the VAD is actually working. So overall treatment with them, treat causes and symptoms that you see. Contact tech support, rely on that VAD center to be your go-to of any type of treatment you need to do for causes or other symptoms that you may find. Now, if CPR does have to occur, there is this myth out or a misunderstanding that if you do CPR, it's going to like rip it off of the heart. There is no empirical or definitive evidence that says if you do CPR on a patient with a VAD that you're going to tear it off of the heart. So do your ABCs times two, if those have failed, begin CPR. So everybody, thank you for tuning in as we covered this case study on a VAD patient with suspected cardiac arrest.